Uh, my name is Obadiah Joe, and I'll be presiding for this session. Uh, and uh, before we proceed, uh, if you will please uh, do uh, put your phones to silence. Uh, so we can uh, listen to the speakers without much interruption, and we thank you for that. Now, uh, the program will proceed as printed uh, with uh, just a slight um, addition, and uh, we'll begin with a meditation from Do Dr. Pamela Moore, uh, an um, Associate Director for Global Engagement um, and then we'll hear greetings from Dr. Carla Martin, the Interim Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration. And we'll be uh, blessed again with a solo uh, from uh, Mr. Connie Hosea. Uh, and right after Hosea Connie is where the change uh, is, and I'll invite Dr. James Garner our Dean and Director for the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Sciences. And uh, he'll do a recognition and a short presentation. Uh, and after that, we'll proceed uh, for lunch. And right after lunch, then we'll have our very own Chancellor, uh, Dr. Lawrence B. Alexander, uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ann uh, M. Bartaska. And thereafter, uh, I will have closing remarks. Uh, and just before uh, I invite Dr. Ghana, I'll also request uh, the catering uh, group to give us an, an, uh, a direction on how to proceed just before lunch. Okay. With that, the program will proceed as pr printed. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we have trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered, out from the gloomy pass, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. I've shared with you excerpts from Lift Every Voice and Sing, traditionally known as the Black National Anthem. This recitation is in commemoration not only of Black History Month, but the 125th year anniversary of the Second Moral Act, and is dedicated to the founders of UAPB and all other 1890 land-grant institutions, as well as the families, farmers, and rural communities we strive so diligently to serve throughout the Arkansas Delta. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you, each of you, to the luncheon program during the 59th Annual Rural Life Conference. Many of you have been here since 7.30 this morning, interacting with poster presenters, and then attending many of the informative workshops that were scheduled for you. 
Your presence and participation today indicates your support of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and its School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences. I want you to know that we appreciate you for being here. We applaud you for the work that you are doing in your communities, and we acknowledge the fact that the discussions that take place here help to effectuate change out there. So on behalf of our chancellor, our faculty, staff, and students, I thank you for being here, and I look forward to seeing each of you here next year. Thank you. <laughs> special uh, presentation, I want to ask Dr. Moore to come back up for a minute. Good afternoon. We have some special international guests that we would like to acknowledge and introduce to you today. Uh, we have with us Professor Mori Diabate, for, uh, pre uh, President of the Université Nord Sud in the Ivory Coast, West Africa. And he is accompanied by Mr. Suleiman Diabate, president of Tropic Enterprises, who is uh, the university's US liaison. And they are here to explore uh, linkage relationships with UAPB. I know some of you uh, are still uh, having your lunch. Uh, we don't want you to stop, uh, but uh, uh, for the sake of time, we will continue with the program. And at this time, I invite uh, Chancellor Lawrence B. Alexander uh, on the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. and Julie, for that introduction. And we thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. Are you enjoying your lunch? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How about a round of applause for that caterer? Yeah. I was informed that the, uh, the uh, peas and the sweet potatoes that we ha we're having at lunch 
are courtesy of UAPB's farm and the East Arkansas Enterprise Community. So a round of applause for our, our folks who produce the food that we eat. And it is good, if I might say so myself. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for the 59th annual Rural Life Conference, where we're looking forward to future innovations and opportunities in sustaining farmers, families, and communities as we celebrate 125 years of service, of providing access and enhancing opportunities as an 1890 land-grant institution. We're always pleased and proud to host the Rural Life Conference, and it is such a good time of year because we get to see all of you come together and meet with you uh, here at the university to talk about issues affecting farming and rural life. And now I am delighted this afternoon to have this opportunity and this very special part on our program to introduce this extraordinary woman of the hour, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Deputy Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, Dr. Ann M. Bartuska. A native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Dr. Bartuska developed an early interest in science. She received her bachelor's from Wilkes College, her master's from Ohio University, and her PhD from West Virginia University. As an ecosystem ecologist, her research is focused on ecosystem processes in landscapes disturbed by coal mining. Dr. Bartuska is the quintessential public servant. She has served as Director of Forest Health Protection and Director of Forest and Range Management for the Forest Service. She's also served as Executive Director of the Invasive Species Initiative of the Nature Conservancy. Just prior to becoming Deputy Undersecretary, she served as Deputy Chief for Research and Development of the U.S. Forest Service. Dr. Portuska is a woman and top administrator who truly cares about the success of 1890 land-grant universities, and she has our mission at heart. When Dr. Garner was in search of a speaker, Dr. Bartuska great, graciously agreed to speak for this special occasion. She took such an interest in our university that she arrived a day early and visited with students, farmers, and various agricultural entities and groups on campus and in our community. I had the great pleasure and the opportunity to meet with her on yesterday to discuss our future plans at UAPB and potential partnerships. We appreciate Dr. Partuska for not only serving as our speaker for our Rural Life Conference Luncheon, but also for taking time to get to know our university and our community. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage a woman of true passion for agriculture, Dr. Ann Bartuska. Thank you, Chancellor, and everybody else at the podium. It's um, a wonderful group to be part of, and all of you. I mean, how many times have we heard what today or what this is about? The 125th anniversary celebration of the 1890s. Fantastic opportunity. Early in the year, we're celebrating it and throughout the year. And for we who are in, in um, USDA in headquarters, it gives us a chance to get out, to meet so many of you, and to be part of this celebration. Now, I've had, as as the Chancellor said, I've had a couple days here now. I did avoid coming down on Wednesday until the snow was done, which was good. Um, so I came down Thursday morning. But um, I've had a chance to, to meet many of the faculty and staff and students, as well as some of the producers who um, UAPB works with. And so I've had now um, ribs from carpenters. I've had fried catfish. I'm taking home a sweet potato pie. I think life's pretty good, actually. So. And my husband's really excited because he's getting a pecan pie to go with it. Um, 
So part of the celebration, why this is so important, is we talk about the 1964 land-grant institutions as the democratization of science and education for this country under President Lincoln. And so the 1890 land grants really follow in that same stead. It's brought education and science, it's brought research and technology development to the historically black colleges and universities throughout the South and actually in the, in the country. And it really has been creating the capacity for us to be able to deliver for those who we care about in rural America, for the farmers and ranchers and foresters out there, I don't want to forget them, um, because it is something that we believe is incredibly important. And so not only are we celebrating 125 years of the 1890 institutions and their potential for growth into the, the next century, but also it's building this foundation for professional development for students, for science, for extension, and really growing rural America, which is a passion of USDA and certainly a passion of mine. And so don't take, just the fact that I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a city, um, my roots are in the rural, rural Pennsylvania. Actually, my roots are actually back to rural Poland and Lithuania, where we were farmers and we did a lot of um, on the ground work. And that really has carried through our family tradition. So this is an important thing for all of us. And this, this whole work that we have to build uh, rural prosperity and to maintain rural prosperity into the future. And again, I think the, the 19 of those institutions that are 1890, in 18 states are really foundational to that. And just so that, as, as um, Mr. Carpenter said yesterday, or no, actually Mr. Douglas was saying yesterday from DNS Produce, you know, you really have to have some skin in the game to make this part of it, you're part of the team. Well, we do have some skin in the game here, here at UAPV. We've spent or have provided $25.5 million in grants from 2011 to 2015, specifically because of capacity building, of growing student population, and adding to the science capacity that exists at these institutions. And we're training a future workforce, and I have to acknowledge that I met with a group of absolutely wonderful undergraduate women students yesterday, and I know some of you are in the room, and I will tell you that based on the, the discussions we had at lunch, you would not only are training people well, but we're in good hands into the future. And so I thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> so let's think about focusing on the future and the challenges that we have to be dealing with in food and agriculture. And one of the things I can tell you is that if you look at the major newspapers, if you look at the uh, media, food and agriculture has really become real again to the American public. Um, maybe it's the local foods movement, I'm not sure, but it has changed the way people view food and agriculture and the values that we place on them. So people are paying attention to what we do, and I think that's something that we can, we can take advantage of. We're all about producing more with less, and one of the, the main things that we have to recognize, and we at the, insti the uh, academic institutions do recognize, that we are producing more food on less acres with less resources now than we did 50 years ago. We're, we're doing it in a sustainable manner. We're, we're supplying the food needs of this country. And it is one of the only areas where we have a positive trade balance with other countries. And so we need to continue to do our investment in research, whether it be basic or applied, as well as the technology development that comes from it, so that we can sustain this ability into the future. But we've got some challenges to work with. We have 9 billion people around the corner. 2050, that's the pro that is the projection. And we have emerging diseases where the crossover between uh, zoonotic diseases, particularly that leads to food safety issues, is out there that we're struggling with. We have water shortages and water contamination. We have 25% uh, of our land is not arable, so we, we're starting from a lower land base. And we still have economic recovery that is not been able to be uh, come back as quickly as it can around the world. So there are some challenges that we have out there, but we've got the tools to be able to move forward into the future. And so what we're all about, and what we really, I think, as a community, whether it be public or private, whether it be academic or uh, applications, it's enhancing and accelerating that agricultural productivity to meet our sustainability needs in terms of conservation practices, as well as sustainable intensification of our food and agricultural systems. And it has got to be globally.
because a lot of the pressures we're going to be facing in this country are pressures coming from out from other countries, especially those that are moving towards from developing to developed where the desire for animal protein is great, where they want to have high quality uh, protein rich diets and how do we do that in a sustainable way and how do we bring the knowledge that we've gained here in our own systems to many of those other countries and functioning as a global, global agricultural production. And then on top of the whole thing, we have this unknown thing called climate change where we thought we had trends that we could work with, stability and rainfall, temperatures, eight inches of snow in Arkansas in February. You know, this is the, no the new normal is going to be this, va this variability and these extremes that we don't know how to predict. So how do we build resiliency into the system even as we know we have to grow our own productivity. So that is one of the big challenges for those of you who are just starting in science and those who are thinking about new areas. Climate resiliency in agricultural production systems is probably one of the big growth areas because we have to get on top of that particular issue. And I think we can because I think we have a lot of the elements already in some of the work that we're doing. And it's also growing the next generation of, of farmers, ranchers, and natural resource professionals. I've already mentioned some of the, the people that I've met here, but I think overall there is an incredible desire to, to build a, a new community of beginning farmers and ranchers who may not be traditionally from the agricultural community. In fact, I met a young couple from Minneapolis who they just decided, you know, if urban living was enough, we wanted to get back to the land, we want to do something, bring something back to our community, how do I do that? And so what we're, we're trying to do is build programs and this bridge from those of you who know how to do it to those who are learning and giving them the opportunity to intern, to train, to understand what it's like, and to give them the diversity of cropping systems that might in fact interest other parts of the country and other markets. And on top of that, especially with the young, younger farmers, what we're finding is how do we use today's technologies? smartphone apps, whoa, there's an opportunity there. GPS-aided precision agriculture or precision irrigation. There's so many new technologies out there that we are using in other ways, from, a lot of them are entertainment ways that can be applied to the future of agriculture. And those are the things we want to capitalize on. So we're excited about that. Even as we have our challenges, I think we have these opportunities. For we at USDA, we've really been focusing on on five major priority areas, and I've kind of touched on them already. One is this whole area of food security, and how do we get all of our programs to be focusing on that? But on top of that is also food safety, because we want to be able to ensure that we have a healthy, sustainable food supply, and that is one thing that, that the food safety issues, especially as we get into some new systems, we have to be very mindful of that. And this is from farm to fork, because that is, it's that whole continuum of the food safety um, spectrum. It's promoting lifelong health through improved nutrition. And even as the president has spoke about precision medicine in the, the State of the Union address, we've internalized it at USDA as precision nutrition. How do you create a diet for you because of your particular combination of health needs, of, of, of things that you want to be able to do with your body, be able to really con develop a diet that is very much yourself and not the norm that might be off any, of any shelf. So how do we promote that and how do we then build working with the food processors to come around to that? Building a bioeconomy. We, we've talked a lot about biofuels. This has been a growth area for many of you as well as for USDA, but it's not stopping at biofuels. The opportunity to build um, bioplastics for the medical community, for example. If we were able to actually get a flexible, bio-based product that can be used in surgical systems. The medical community has told us they would move into the $6 billion business immediately because for their community, the consumer wants um, products that are bio-based. But we're not there yet, so that is a huge, huge opportunity. And then lastly is developing long-term sustainable agricultural systems that are resilient to climate change. We can't ignore that. We know that we have, have got to address this from, if it's nothing else, that it's drought and extreme temperatures, and we have got to get on top of that in terms of the systems that we're working with, both plant-based and animal-based.
So it's a short list, but a very, very powerful one. And it's one that we're spending time on both with our intramural programs like Agricultural Research Service and Economic Research Service, as well as with the external, um, the, the extramural, like National Institute of Food and Agriculture that funds so many of our grant programs. And to be able to achieve this and with our college and university partners, to be able to engage the private sector so that we have shared priorities and really bring all of our resources to bear. But fundamental to knowing this is what do we have and what are we, where are we going with that? And so I do have to give a shout out to our National Ag Statistics Service, who actually is here. I know they had a booth out there. Because our ability to know where we're going is predicated on knowing where we are and what the trends are, so that programs can be better, better tuned. And the Census of Agriculture is a really powerful tool to help us identify that signature. And one of the things that we've realized is that we have been under-reporting women and minority farmers, who are the fastest growing areas in the agricultural sector. And so these, a lot of these small farming communities are building, or farm, small farming operations, are really uh, on the, um, with the, the, the graces of women farmers and the minority farmers who are moving into many of our areas. And so how do we ensure that we capture those who are actually doing this farming, and then what their needs are, because we've been told their needs are different. And so that's, a bit, to me, a very important part of our future. And, and I'm pleased to say that, that NASA has, has actually t um, identified in 2016 a modification or an additional survey to add to the census that would help us get better numbers of that new and emerging sector. One of the areas that's near and dear to my heart, and is, I was introduced as an ecosystem ecologist. Well, I happen to be married to a wetlands ecologist. And so we talk about water over the dinner table a lot. And, um, and it is one of those areas that I think is critically important for us to build into our agricultural thinking. You all know it. Arkansas has been struggling with this issue of too much, a lot of water some places, not enough others. I think that the fact that you've moved forward with a new Arkansas water plan is really a, a strong <laughs> signal of the importance the state has placed on water planning not just letting things happen as they are. But we need to be able to, to recognize the constraints that we have on our system and the role that agriculture plays. 87% of America's surface water supply is att attached to forests or, or agricultural landscapes. So our stewardship of that land directly links to the water that comes out of our taps. We, we at the same time, 80% of that water is being used, water consumption rather, is being used for agriculture. So not only are we trying to steward the water, but then we're consuming the water. Now there's an interesting challenge right there. That, and so how do we then increase the efficiency of our water use in our agricultural systems, reduce the amount of water we are consuming, not necessarily using? And, that's, and there's a difference because you can actually use water, but let it stay in the system through appropriate irrigation technologies, drainage systems, or changing how a plant uses water. And one of the real opportunities is to create, continue to use breeding practices to, to change how plants um, actually use and optimize water use efficiency as well as nutrient use. Providing technical and financial assistance to land managers has got to be part of our portfolio around a sensible water sustainability um, system. And also looking at things from a watershed perspective, not farm by farm, plot by plot, but truly taking a much, much larger landscape. And I have to commend NRCS and the Forest Service for both taking on these larger conservation areas as a way to be looking at how you can better integrate your program. And then lastly, how do we prudently use the 193 million acres of national forests and rangeland that we hold dear in the USDA as part of our water conservation strategy? Because 53% of the headwaters of the United States are on the lands that we manage. So we have an obligation as a steward also. So I guess the message here is we've got to increase our cultural production. We've got to do it sustainably. Sustainable intensification is, is a concept I think we're trying to talk more through science. And we have to actively incorporate challenges around water and how we manage that water. So a short agenda for all of us to be thinking about. But one I think, again, that is very doable with the partnership between the public and private sector. A couple last things I want to mention, and, and just because the timing has been incredible, just last week, the Dietary Guidelines Assessment has come out. 
It is the new analysis of what our diets should be based on science into the future. And it's got a lot of people, at least in my part of the world, talking about what it has recommended with regard to cholesterol, with regard to animal protein, with regard to sustainability and managing with it a lower environmental footprint. How that translates to policy is still an open question. But I think it does put a really fine point on what is a healthy, nutritious diet. And I've mentioned already precision nutrition. Well, think about what that would translate to you. Well, probably would mean for me at least a lot of sweet potatoes in my diet, which is great, of course, because we've got, they're a terrific source of fiber. They're high in, in a lot of, of things that we need to be eating. And it's a good, it's a good carb, not a bad carb. But what does that mean for other people? And how do, we, how do we look at those diets and how we could actually create more products that actually help meet the needs of those, those diets? And so adding more anthocyanins through breeding to, to potatoes, which I think we talked about, increasing blue and, and purple potatoes. But there are a lot of new, new strategies out there that will enhance the nutritional factor of the foods we eat every day. And I think that's where science and nutrition programs really can come, come together. And then moving it out through the extension system. And I think that's where I have to give a shout out to NIFA's expanded food and nutrition education, <coughs> excuse me, education program as one mechanism to do that. We're also investing in a national nutrient database so that we can have the comp ed food composition data that allows those who are doing the science and then nutritionists who are moving into practice to be better understand what these foods that we consume are comprised with, and this idea of precision nutrition to really address that. So again, a lot of challenges in production systems of health and, and nutrition. But again, all things that the building blocks are we have. And, and to me, that's, that means that we can do more and we can continue to improve. And then the last, the last piece I want to come back to is something where I started with, which was rural prosperity and, and the importance of rural America to all of this. Um, James had mentioned earlier that 2%, um, the 2% 2 of us grow the, the food for 98% of us. Well, that 2% is in rural America, and it is where we have to maintain a very strong and stable rural America to be able to continue to have a food and agricultural system that is, is important. It's an essential part of the emerging bioeconomy. Because bio means biology. Well, what does biology mean? It's those plants and animals out there. It gets back to the fundamentals. And so whether we're growing for bioenergy production or, bi or growing for food that includes a bioeconomy um, component, those are things that we can really be taking on. And it will be having a strong rural America that does that. Some of you are aware of this, but I do feel I needed to mention that the, the president has put a value on a rural America explicitly by establishing a rural council. That rural council brings all the cabinet members together under the Secretary of Agriculture to talk about how programs, whether they be tar Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, can be brought to bear on the needs of rural America. And in addition, our secretary has identified five pillars that are, he has continued to support for rural prosperity, increasing access to broadband broadband and continuous business creation, developing local and regional food systems, which I've seen some evidence of here already, capitalizing on climate change opportunities, and this is the resiliency factor and adaptation, and how do we recreate new products for that, developing a renewable energy that is sustainable, and then lastly, generating and retaining green jobs through recreation and natural resources, which we have abundantly on many of our, our forests and rangelands. So it is, it's something that's important at USDA. It's something that the, our secretary has explicitly addressed. For my part of USDA, we want to make sure it's built on sound science and that we support the scientific institutions like UAPB to be able to deliver that. But at the same time that we help may grow the next professionals and the future professionals as well as the farmers and ranchers who can help deliver that through the programs that we have. So uh, hopefully I give you a flavor of what we see our priorities and that you are part of, as well as how much we value the, the aspects of rural America that are being celebrated here for the 59th year. And so uh, thank you very much for giving, giving me some time to talk about these ideas and to maybe be invited back at the 60th or 61st, because it's, it's great fun to be able to be here. Thank you so much.
we always like to give our speaker a list, uh, a token to, for them to remember us by. So, Dr. Tosca, uh -huh. this is a, a another cross pin like the one I had this morning, but I forgot to mention that your name is engraved on it. Ooh. So, your name is engraved on it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Bataska, uh, for that uh, motivating, uh, stimulating, and most certainly challenging presentation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, well, Dr. Gara did ask me to be very brief on remarks, uh, <laughs> which I appreciate, <laughs> and, and I'll try to do just that. Uh, before I do that, let's give another round of applause to Dr. Bataska. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, allow me to thank each and every one of you uh, for making this conference a great success. Um, there are many people here who have been working since uh, somewhere back in August, October, and uh, you have made it all worth the work that they have put in. And uh, I, I also <clears throat> uh, want to uh, believe that you have gained a lot of knowledge uh, through the workshops and sessions that you have uh, been listening to, listening to, and uh, that will enable you to pursue innovative ways and opportunities to sustain the farmers, the families, and the communities from where you came. So we are uh, believing, we are not hoping, we are believing that uh, all that has been presented to us is going to uh, make a difference to our communities. Okay. Uh, at this moment, uh, let me try to make some acknowledgments. And since I thanked all of you, if I omit you, just know that you've already been acknowledged. Uh, but uh, let me start off with the platform guests. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for all you have done uh, for us. And we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the farmers. And it's, it's kind of sad to know that only 2% of the 98% produce the food that sustains us. So we really are very thankful to the farmers who are here. And, and yes. Thank you. Uh, and to the students, uh, this year we have uh, invited students. And uh, since this is a young group of uh, individuals, I'll ask uh, all the students who are here to please stand. Okay. Thank you. Like you heard from uh, Dr. Pataska uh, and, and um, a, a number of other people, uh, you are our future. We are looking to you uh, to carry forward with the tasks that have been outlined very clearly here today. Uh, and along with those students, uh, we, well, somebody nudged me, and I better do this because I have to go back to, to campus after this. Uh, <laughs> I was reminded that I need to acknowledge uh, our own, one of our students, who is the, the president of the Student Government Association, I believe. Michelle Martin, are you here? I know she was here earlier. She may have gone back to class. Uh, but we are very pleased to, to have her from uh, not only our school, but our department. Okay. Uh, then to our partners. Uh, all the federal agencies that are presented here, um, we, 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 we thank you for all that you do for us and with us. Uh, the state agencies that are presented here, and, and uh, I'll not list uh, uh, them because, I, again, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, we're very thankful for you. Now, like I mentioned, there's a group of people who work very hard to make this to come to reality. 
uh, all the, uh, the, the, the conference planning committees uh, that are listed at the back of uh, your schedule. Those individuals there, when you get a chance, please do thank them. They worked so hard. Uh, they worked, Dr. Gunn and I also, so hard. And to the workshop presenters, uh, we, we can't thank you enough. And we look forward to, for you to coming back with more innovative ways and ideas to share with us. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, I, of course, I cannot forget the faculty uh, who are behind, behind those students. And all of you faculty who are here, uh, don't get on me after this. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so thank you all very much. And uh, with this, uh, I wish each and every one of you a very safe uh, trip back and a wonderful remaining part of the year. Thank you.